So over the last couple weeks, we've been talking about an equipped and mature body, one that fits the head who is Christ, one that is mobile, one that is mature, one that eventually does what Jesus did and fills the earth with his presence, with his message. And uh, we're going to be talking about the ways that we do that. We've, we've started talking over the last couple of weeks. We talked about what it looks like when we're an equipped and mature body. Uh, again, the result of that is that we, we multiply and we fill the earth. Uh, last week, we honed in specifically on uh, the start of the gifting that is listed out there in Ephesians. Paul tells us that uh, Christ gave his spirit and equipped the church. He gave gift people to the church. Some are apostles, some are prophets, some are evangelists, some are shepherds, and some are teachers. And last week we talked about the apostolic role. What does it look like for the apostolic church to become mature? It looks like we're a sent people, people that are sent out with a purpose, with a commission, that where we are in our city, where we are in our places of work, wherever we go, that is not a mistake. That is a place that you have been sent. And so we talked about the reality of that. This week, we want to dive into the second uh, gift, the second person, type of person that Paul lists, the prophets. Now, uh, a few years back, I was in a church and I got to be a part of a group that was dedicated to doing what we called prophetic prayer. Now, what that really just means is that we sat around in a dark, quiet room and we asked God to speak and then we listened. You know how like communication is kind of two-way? right? If like I'm just doing all the talking with my wife and she's doing all the listening, which does not happen, okay? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I didn't, okay, can I, we're going <laughs> to take that back. <laughs> uh, it's, if it's really just one-sided, right? That's not a very balanced relationship. If I'm doing all the talking and she's doing all the listening, right? Communication is a two-way thing. And so we were taking this really, really seriously. And so we were saying, Lord, we want to listen to you. And specifically, God, we want to listen to you about what you're saying about our church and what we are supposed to do. Like, what is the work that you're giving us? However you want to speak, you, we are open to receiving that. And it started out really, really beautiful. And guess what? It worked. We heard Like God was telling us, this is what I want you to do, or at least we had the sense that God was telling us what to do in our hearts, or maybe he would give a picture or a scripture to somebody and they would share that and we'd we'd talk about it. And what I found though over time is what led of one week of listening and and talking about God, what God was saying to us led into another week of listening and and talking about what God had said to us. And those two weeks led into months and those months led into years. And what was intended to start out as a group that was figuring out how to be a faithful people, an obedient people to what God has given us, ended up becoming a disobedient people. Because all we did was listen and we didn't act. God was telling us what to do, and there was this gap between what he was telling us to do and our actions, a gap between our actions and God's heart. And I tell you what, I felt that gap in the middle of the time. And I would come home so many days frustrated after this weekly prayer time together, and I would share it with Janine, and we'd get frustrated together, because <laughs> misery loves company, right? And I was just like, I'm so frustrated. Like, we just keep talking about it, and it's so good. And if we just took one action step toward this, it would feel so right, because that's what we're supposed to do. We got frustrated about the gap that we felt between where we were and God's heart, the things he was telling us to do. What I've noticed is that life is full of these gaps. You don't have to look very far for these gaps. Uh, One of the ones that came quickly to mind was the increasing gap in the middle of America between the haves and the have-nots. Right? It's been decades of conversation. This gap between the haves and the have-nots, the resourced and, and the well-off and the under-resourced, and those lacking in access. We see it all over. We see it in gender inequality. We feel that gap, right? There's all sorts of these gaps, and you don't even have to pick the big ones. You could come down to the street level and realize that there's gaps in our society, but they're well-hidden, like the father who wants to be a good father, 
but all he knows how to do is perpetuate the cycle that he has seen, which is abusive, verbally, emotionally, or whatever. These are the gaps that if we're paying attention, they're all around us. It's the gap between how things could be or should be based on God's heart and the world we actually live in, our own behaviors, our own thoughts, the way we do things, there's this gap. And I want to refer to this gap as the prophetic gap. Because the reality is, as we talk about this gifting, this equipped, mature church, this church that has the capacity to fill all of the world with the presence of God, at the heart, a piece of this church is being prophetic. It's a church that recognizes the gap and understands how we move into it, not in the way that the world does. You see, the world feels this gap too. In fact, the, the, the prophetic gap that the world feels oftentimes gets labeled as social justice. It's a very real gap that's being felt. There's injustices that are being felt in the world around us, but we lack the gospel words and the Christ-like action that it is necessary in order to fill that gap. And so we start looking at systems and we start looking at all other things that at the end of the day can't fill the gap. It can't reduce the distance between how we're acting and what we're doing, or how we're acting in God's heart. Only God can do that. It's the role of the prophetic church to step into that and do more than just talk about the gap. But as we'll find, it moves us toward action. It's a unique role that the prophetic church plays, and we want to make sure that we're scripturally grounded I was just joking out uh, ahead of time with people as we were talking about this. We were talking with the volunteers and praying over the service. And I said, you know, nobody has a problem with the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. We're like, those are good. Bring them on. We love them. Apostles and prophets, hold on. Hold on. I'm uncomfortable. Right? Uh, apostolic and prophetic church, wait a second. Are you sure that's what the Bible says? Actually, I am. Let's go there. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start there. This is going to kind of give us a, a scriptural foundation of how, even, how, is even the apost or how even is the prophetic church possible. Like, where is our foundation for that? Well, we want to make sure that we're biblically grounded, that we are a people of the word. And so we're going to go to Acts chapter 2, and what's interesting before we dive in here in verse 17 is that we are finding ourselves... <clears throat> directly following God's pouring out of his spirit on everyone who follows Jesus, everyone who confesses Jesus in the day of Pentecost, they are filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then something crazy happens. They start speaking in tongues and there's this outpouring and it's the kind of tongues where people are starting to hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus spoken about in their own native languages as there's this kind of melting pot of cultures uh, all, all in the same place at one time around Jerusalem, around the place that Pentecost the cost is happening. And so as this happens, it rolls out in the street and people are hearing the good news of Jesus and they're like, what is going on? How is this even possible? These people must be drunk, right? That's the understanding as we head into this. But Peter corrects it. He stands up and he says, you know, these guys, myself, we're not drunk as you suppose. Like it's only the morning like that. <laughs> Give us some time. Um, he says, no, Actually, what has happened is to fulfill a prophecy. This was actually what you're seeing has, is the fulfillment of something that was spoken about long ago, and this was always the plan. You just, you weren't ready for it. You couldn't, like, you're not seeing it. You don't understand it. And so he starts in on this, this beautiful message, this presentation of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Oh, thank you. I need that. The good news of Jesus. And he starts by referring to a prophecy of Joel. And instead of reading it from Joel, we're going to read it uh, as, as Peter actually declares this prophecy because he twists, uh, changes just a couple things. I don't mean twist in a bad sense. I mean, he helps us understand something even deeper that Peter was talking about. So with that, let's dive in. We're just going to read two short verses. starting with verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. 
Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. What's interesting is that Right at the beginning, we see a little change. If you go back and you read Joel chapter 2, starting at verse 28, you're going to read this same prophecy, only it starts a little bit different. What Joel actually says is he says following, like afterward. After something happens, then these things are going to take place. Now, what's interesting and what it sets up for all of us is the season of time that we're in. You see, Peter takes that afterward comment, and he changes it to the words, in the last days. Now, that's significant. It's not just something to be read over. It's significant because it signals the time that we actually live in. We're not waiting anymore for the afterward. What Peter is saying is, guess what? You're in the afterward. You are in the times that Joel was talking about. When he talked about this pouring out of the Spirit, when he talked about everything that would happen when, when that takes place, That's the season we're in. And so instead of saying afterward, which was actually signaling, if you read back through Joel, Joel was talking about uh, the turning back of the people of God to God's heart. Joel was seeing the gap of where Israel was and what would be necessary to line them up with the heart of God, and that's a process called repentance. It means a change of direction, a change of direction in our hearts and a change of direction in our minds and our thinking. And Joel says, after that repentance happens, then this will happen. Peter stands up and he says, guess what? That has taken place and it happens in the person of Jesus. That's what Peter's pointing to and what he's going to get to in just a second. That we are in this afterward season. We are in this season of what Peter says are the last days. He says, in the last days, God says... I will pour out my spirit on all people. So Peter first says, we are in the last days. That time between the ascension of Jesus, when Jesus arose to the right hand of the throne of the Father, that place that is above all other places, he ascends to the name that is higher than any name, any other name. He has all authority in heaven and on earth from that time until the return of our coming king. We are in the last days. And part of the marker, Joel, and again, Peter says, is that God, through Jesus, will pour out his Holy Spirit on all people. Now, again, all people may not uh, mean too much to us. We're like, okay, that's cool. Uh, Everybody gets a little spirit, right? It's like Oprah. (laughs) You get the spirit, and you get the spirit, and check under your seat. You get the spirit, too. (laughs) I'm sorry for that. That was, it's just because Deb's back. There's somebody to laugh again. That's good. No, but this is significant. It's significant because in terms of Jesus's audience, in terms of Peter's audience, like all people was not really a thing. There were segments of society There were people that were higher than other people and more important and more significant than other people. There were classes and levels. And it went, first, servants, okay? Barely considered people, didn't have rights, none of that. And then just above them, but only slightly, were women. And then above them, males of younger age, and then above them, adult men. This was the hierarchy. And then, you know, beyond that, we had uh, levels of elite in politics and all of that and the ruling class and the nobility and all of that. There were different levels and different classes as well. And what Peter's doing is he's saying, see all of that? The spirit is not partitioned out based on where you fall in this hierarchy. It isn't just for the elite. It isn't just for the significant It isn't just for men and women, all people. And that's why he points out. He says, your sons and daughters, you see the significance between those two is that men were uh, favored. 
especially firstborn males. They would get the, the majority of the inheritance, and then the rest of the sons would be parceled out in their inheritance. And unless you were an only child as a girl, you got nothing. And even then, they would prefer to marry you off so that your inheritance could be claimed by another male. Guess what? In the spirit of Jesus, in the gifting, in the wisdom of Jesus, women aren't cut out. Guys aren't the most important. They don't have the most significant things to say. Their dreams and visions are not better to what women have to offer us in the spirit. He, co- he goes on. Young men will see dreams, old men, uh, young men will see visions, old men will dream dreams. Again, he points out this, this different levels, different classes, one marked by foolish behavior and one marked by wisdom. And he says, you know what? God's going to give it to both of them too. Age doesn't matter. You are never too young to be useful and you're never out of commission on the other end. servants, both men and women. It doesn't matter if you are barely considered a person or even less than a person. If you have less rights than livestock, guess what? You get the spirit too. Because that's not God's system. And already here we see that God is filling the gap between where society was and where he intends to bring them. And the filling is his spirit, the sending, the equipping, the gifting of his spirit. So even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. He comes full circle, starts with pouring out the spirit, goes again to pouring out the spirit, and then he adds, and they will prophesy. Who will prophesy? All of them. (laughs) What's interesting is prophecy was only limited to the religious elite. It was only saved for prophets, kings, and priests, but as scholar I. Howard Marshall states it, he says this, the first and main theme of the prophecy, referring to Joel 2, is that God is going to pour out his spirit upon all people, i.e. upon all kinds of people and not just upon the prophets, kings, and priests, as had been in the Old Testament. Everything before the Gospels were written, it was reserved for the political elite, the monarchy, the the prophets as a role, the prophets as a singular person who would deliver the message of God. All of that, the boundaries are erased. No longer do we have prophets and kings and priests who prophesy. God has a people, and it is his body in unity that will prophesy. That's our role. (laughs) But it does matter then what prophecy is. It does matter what we mean by prophecy. And so we're going to dive into that next. I want to ask you to turn um, just a little farther to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're going to define a little bit what prophecy looks like. We're going to start right at the beginning of the chapter, verse 1 through 4. It says this, following the way, uh, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them, but they utter mysteries of, by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people, listen to this, for their strengthening, encourage, encouragement, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but but the one who prophesies edifies the church. Now, I'm sorry to disappoint some of you because you're wondering, you're like, all right, let's talk about tongues. Like, this has been a thing in the church for decades. Why? I don't know. Right? Why is it such a big deal? I don't know. We don't trust one another, I guess. We have a body that's divided, and so these things become significant to us, right? And when the body's divided, we're like, hey, hand, I I see you. You're weird. What are you doing? I'm not doing that. Oh, you're doing that. Uh, That's weird. That's how we feel. We feel divided. We feel split. We feel like we need to give something more attention. I'm sorry. We're not dealing with tongues this morning. (laughs) 
If you want to talk about that, we can talk. Let's talk. There's some good stuff in here that we could pull out, but it would honestly miss the point because this isn't as much about tongues, although he certainly addresses it. Apparently, the the church in Corinth was a very spiritually gifted church. They were manifesting a lot of gifts of the Spirit, and they were going uh, kind of wild with them, so much so that it was actually becoming an inhibition to people entering into the body of Christ. Did, Did you know that it's possible to use your gifting in a way that actually does the reverse of what it's intended to do? But instead, we call it freedom, and we do it anyway. That's not the purpose of the gifts. In fact, we find in here, we see the the greatest gift of these four verses is the definition that Paul gives to the gift specifically of prophecy, but by extension to a lot of other gifts as well, that they are intended for a purpose, not just for our own pleasure and enjoyment. Right? And so let's get down into it. He starts with, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. So he starts all of this in love. And if you want to take anything to tongues or any other spiritual gift that we're not really talking about, take this today. That every single gift and every single thing that we say is meant to be tempered and restricted by love. If it is not loving and you have to put the term truth on it, you're just finding a way around love. (laughs) But I'm speaking the truth in love. You are speaking an opinion, and you are saying the word love, but that's about as close as they're getting, right? We do that all the time. So if you want to take something, and you want to apply it to all the gifts, I want you just to hold on to that one thing. Let your gifting be shaped and limited and governed by this love factor. Okay, and that love factor is meant to be defined and certainly would be defined by Paul who's writing this. It would be defined by the person of Jesus in the ultimate act of love in laying down his entire life, being obedient even to death by torture on a cross. That kind of love, let that govern your spiritual gifting. All right? And then he says this, eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. I've talked with a number of people who say, we don't pursue the gifts. I'm like, really? Really? Okay, why? We're not supposed to. Really? Why? It's not biblical. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Let's take a little trip. Let's take a little trip to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 where Paul says, no, eagerly desire the gifts. They're not just allowed. They're not just active and present. They are something to be desired. We are meant to desire them, but only when we're governed by love and when the gifts are used for their intended purpose. The gifts are not a means or they are not an end in and of themselves. That's an idol. A gift is meant as a, to be used as a tool to accomplish a specific purpose. And then he goes into verse 2, and he's going to define that purpose for us in a second, especially in regard to prophecy, because he says, eagerly desire the gifts, especially the gift of prophecy, okay? And he goes on, he mentions the tongues again, which seem to be a little bit of a a, a bump in the road for the church of Corinth. He says, for anyone who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to people, but to God. Nobody understands them, but they do utter mysteries of the Spirit, okay? So good, beneficial, maybe the wrong place, wrong time, okay? Verse 3, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. And here's, we, here's where we get down to it. What does prophecy do? What does a prophetic church do? The prophetic church is meant to be one who is about the strengthening, encouraging, and comfort of the body. Now, if we really want to dive into it, we have to understand uh, some things as they've been worked out historically, because what Paul says here about prophecy is not just true for the New Testament church, it's true for everything that we've understood about the gift of prophecy over time and history. In the Old Testament or in the New Testament, this function of prophetic, of prophecy, of the prophetic gifting, it is the same all the way through, even though we kind of, we kind of make this divide where what happened in the Old Testament doesn't happen in the New Testament. The way the prophets operated in the Old Testament are not how prophets operate in the New Testament. There is a difference. I would argue that's actually not true. That what Paul is saying is that the gift of prophecy, he doesn't say the gift of the prophecy going forward, the gift of the prophecy starting at Pentecost, the gift of the prophecy in the future will be for this. No, he says the gift of prophecy, period. Period. 
The gift of prophecy is for these three things. As scholar Leon Morris states it and just sums it up, he says, prophecy then is a means of building up Christian character, of encouraging and strengthening people, and of giving them comfort in their distress. At its best, this is what the prophet does. This is what the prophetic prophetic church does. If we break it down... And we look in the Old Testament, we see that at one time the prophets were used to help author and write out scripture. Anything that is scripture, we consider prophetic, meaning that it is given by God. It is an oral statement given from God and proclaimed to people and then written down. So that is true about it. The prophets helped do that. But if we're paying attention, what we find as you read scripture is that while that still happens, there's an element of foretelling in the prophet's function in the church of what will be or this will happen. As we see the prophets go on over time, we see that more often than not, they're not giving something new. We do see something new in Joel, Joel's foretelling in that prophecy we read out of Joel 2 that Peter restates. There is that foretelling, but if you look at the rest of those prophetic writings, if you look at the rest of what prophets did in the Old Testament, it was more often than not, it was calling people back into alignment with what had already been spoken. Maybe not foretelling always, but what we might call forthtelling. Speaking forth that which has already been written, that which God has already established and saying, hey, listen, there's this gap, Israel, between how you're living and how God has called you to live. Time and time again, we see throughout Israel's history that they are charged with, uh, listen, you are not loving the outsider. You are not loving and taking care of the poor. You are only concerned with yourself. There is a selfishness to this people. At other times, God might point out and say, I have given you a mission and you are failing in that mission. In fact, we can't even get to the mission because you've fallen out of relationship with me. You need to get back in relationship. You need to close the gap. And so prophets would point to that and they would say, listen, these are the things that God said would happen if you fall out of that. If you, if you leave this gap there, these things are bad. It, it happens when you are outside of relationship with God, but when you are in relationship with God, then these are the blessings. All the prophets did uh, over time uh, eventually was simply call people to close the gap between where they were living and God's heart for them. We see that, though, continue on even into the New Testament, that that closing of the gap is actually uh, an, an example of strengthening, encouraging, and comforting the people of God, both in the people of Israel and outside of the people of Israel. And now we have prophets in the New Testament. Instead of pointing to this law and these rituals that Israel would do that prophets called them back into, all of those things were meant to point to Jesus. They were all foretastes and foreshadowing of the person of Jesus. The work he would do, every atonement sacrifice, everything that was meant to make up for where they had gone wrong, all pointed to the person of Jesus and it was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And so if there is a switch in the role of prophets, it's not that they are no longer doing what they did. They are simply pointing to a different place now. They're not saying come back to the law, come back to the teachings, come back to uh, the revelations of God as we see them. They are saying come back to Jesus. He is the fulfillment of the law. He is the fulfillment of everything good that we could never measure up to, but he did it. The only difference, friends, is is that the, the prophetic church now points back to Jesus. That when there is a gap, they say, here's the gap. And the answer to that gap is Jesus. It's coming back to relationship with Jesus, and it will always be that. In Jesus, we talked uh, last week about uh, the, the apostles call people out to be sent, sent in the, in the words of Jesus, to, to speak the words and proclaim the words of Jesus, to live out the ways of Jesus or the same way that Jesus did, and then his, the works of Jesus as well, and to do the things that we saw Jesus doing or that we read about Jesus doing. That's what we are sent to do. It's the prophet's role to say, here is where we're out of line with those things. Here's where we are out of line with the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. We're saying this, but we're not being obedient. There's a gap between our talking and our doing. 
Here's the way that Jesus lived. He had compassion on people who the society wouldn't have compassion on, but Jesus had compassion on them. Church, here's the gap between Jesus's compassion and our compassion. That's the prophetic gap. Jesus was one who worked miracles by the power of the Spirit. And he told his followers to, to participate in miracles, to show compassion, to live this naturally super, every, supernatural life every single day, the nitty gritty of life as followers of Jesus' church. Here's what Jesus did and here's where we are. Here's the gap. The prophetic church sits in that gap. They realize it, they feel it, they sense it. The prophets would look around at the nation of Israel or at the early church and they would say, okay, Here's where we are. This is what's going on. Here's what society is doing. Here's what we're doing. But over here is the heart of God. We need to get to that place. Not something else defined for us in the world, not something else uh, in the systems of the world, but the systems of Jesus. The church feels that gap. And the truth is, the prophetic church does this. The prophetic church aligns our hearts with the words, ways, and works of Jesus. The prophetic church aligns our hearts with the words, ways, and works of Jesus. It's always calling us back. It's calling us to be faithful to that. Faithfulness to the words Jesus spoke and the things he taught Faithfulness to the patterns and the rhythms that Jesus lived out, his intimacy with the Father, the prophetic church, calls our hearts back to that. And the things that Jesus did, the prophetic church calls our hearts to that. It calls us to repentance. It calls us to feel it. As Alan Hirsch points out, although prophets have a futuristic orientation, we talked about that a little bit, their real focus is a call to live in the existential here and now of faithfulness and obedience. It is certainly a caricature to see them as fortune tellers, right? Who doesn't want that? Because even when they do predict or refer to the future, their primary concern is to motivate their listens to live, listeners to live faithfully in light of that future possibility. You see, the prophetic church doesn't simply talk about the future. They call us to live in light of the future. The truth is, friends, we have a returning and coming king. When we talk about bringing the kingdom wherever we go, that means that we are a foretaste people. That we are people that are like signpost telling about something that's coming. That is the return of Jesus who will set up his kingdom, that will set uh, all things broken right. As my son's Bible says, he will make all of the sad things come untrue. But until that day, friends, the prophetic church calls us back into alignment to be a people that say, listen, in light of the coming king, in light of the future judgment, in light of all of that, how then should we live now? Because oftentimes we feel that gap between how we should live now and how we're actually living. It would be so easy to say that the prophetic church is a mirror to the rest of the world. <laughs> no. Remember, we're actually called for the strengthening, encouragement, and comfort of the body. In light of the world around us, in light of what's right and what's wrong, in light of what we, where we are and where we should be, the prophetic church feels that gap and calls us to alignment so that we might be equipped to be a faithful people of God. A people who really truly reflect him and say, listen, here, here's not the full picture of what it'll be when he returns, but when he returns, it's gonna be a little bit like this. And we pray for the sick. <clears throat> And whether somebody gets healed or not, we pray for the sick because we understand in the future, God will heal the sick. So we start asking now. We understand that one day when Jesus returns, we will be in perfect union with him and we will walk side by side. So as a foretaste people, as a new creation project people, we start to do that now to the best of our abilities, empowered by the spirit of God. <clears throat> 
That's what we mean when we say we're bringing the kingdom wherever we go. We're saying wherever we go, people have a chance to feel that gap between God's heart and where we actually are now closed in just a little bit more. So that people, as scripture say, can actually come and taste and see that the Lord is good. People can taste and see that the Lord is good as we grow as a prophetic church and as we understand that we are called to be a faithful people of God. Disciples of Jesus are not those who just know a lot about Jesus and know how to study scripture. That's all good. It's necessary. It's right. But it's not the full picture. A disciple is somebody who learns how to be obedient to the voice of God in our everyday life. And we get better at increasing obedience. The prophetic gifting in the church helps us do that better. It starts with feeling the gap. It starts with sensing it. Some of you are really strong gap feelers. You look around at society, you look at the church, you look at your neighborhood or even yourself or your family, and you feel the gap between where things are and where they could be or should be based on the heart of God. We need your help to equip us and to be a better equipped and mature body that will one day fill the earth, one that is fitting of the head who is Christ so that we can move and we can do what we're intended to do. And church, the rest of us, even if you're not a gap feeler, the rest of us are called to start feeling those gaps a little bit better. (laughs) To notice them. So I want to give us just a couple key directions for going forward this week so that we can be better gap feelers, so that we can be raised up to be a faithful people. Not just a sent people, that's just a part of the equation, but also a faithful people to be able to answer the question as we go out, how then should we live? In light of what is to come, how then should we live now? The first step would simply be look at the world around you. Look at the world around you. You see, a prophetic church needs to be an observant church. We need to be paying attention to what's going on around us. And by that, I don't mean like in the judgy way (laughs) where we're like doing that wrong. That's, don't do that. You're wrong over there. Like we're not meant to be on a megaphone shouting at the world about everything that's going wrong. That's not the purpose of the prophetic church. The prophetic church is one who looks at ourselves and say, how has God called us to live and how then should we live? How are we operating? And when it gets really, to to get really clear, I'm not asking you to start observing how well I'm doing in feeling the gap, right? That's a mess. I'm asking you to start feeling the gap of where God is calling you to act. You can ask me to change things all day and all we're doing is we're thinking about power the same way the world does, which is a top-down system. I'm not asking you to look at a top-down system in the church so that we mirror the world. I'm asking the gap feelers in here to help us figure out how to live a Jesus-style people, a Jesus-style justice system, a Jesus-style gap awareness system, not just the trend of the day. We all have our thing. We all have the thing we care about. I'm asking us as a prophetic church to lay aside the thing that we care about and ask God what he cares about. That starts by looking around at the world, what is right, what is wrong, where is God moving, what is he doing, what is out of sync with it. What's interesting is we have this saying that says familiarity breeds contempt, right? But what if familiarity doesn't always bring uh, contempt? What if familiarity actually simply breeds indifference? What if we don't get all the way to that negative side of contempt, but we just kind of stop seeing things? We stop noticing things. Friends, a prophetic church needs to be an observant church, one who throws off indifference and starts paying attention to what's actually going on. Not around the entire world, but in the world you inhabit what's going on. And then secondly, after we've looked around, 
I want to ask you to find the gaps. What is happening and then where are the gaps? That requires us to know two things. Again, first, what is happening, that observance aspect. But uh, secondly, what is God's heart for the situation? How does he feel about what's going on? Not just what is happening, but how does he feel about what's happening? Not how does somebody around you feel about what's happening, how does God feel about what's happening? The church feels that gap. It sees it, but it also feels it. One of the gaps Janine and I saw uh, in our life was not one um, that was as apparent as it would seem. We, uh, many of you know, we did foster care for uh, six years. And during that time, uh, we saw a lot of things that we would just think, oh my goodness, man, if the church would just step up to that. Uh, One of the reasons we got involved in foster care in the first place is uh, we both read a book that said if, uh, that in in part of its argument in social justice in the world, that if everybody in the church stepped up and uh, fostered a child, there would be no more need for beds in the world around us. In the foster care system, there would be no need for more families. And so we were like, oh my goodness, oh, we got to step into that. After our first foster care placement, we were like, that, okay, hold up. That might not be the full picture. There's other things that go on with this. Maybe maybe not everybody should be a foster parent. (laughs) Maybe, like at times we're like, should we even be foster parents? But God had called us to step into the gap, and and the gap that we truly realized that was there was not the need for people in church to step up and start fostering so that there would be no more places. The biggest gap we saw was the need for church to come around broken families to give them a better example of what family looks like. Because all people are really doing is perpetuating the cycles that they've been in. But we stopped and we looked and we saw this is, this is what we think the gap is. And then we started praying about it and we, we felt God's heart for the situation. And in God's heart for the situation, it wasn't just it, get more people to foster. That wasn't the answer. God's heart was, man, I care about these families. You can get more people to fill beds, but tomorrow they're going to take another kid out of a family. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and there will never be a shortage because the gap isn't in filling the beds. The gap is in people being discipled and brought to the heart of Jesus. We need families who will show other people what a true Jesus uh, style support system looks like when we wrap around them and we say, let us be your family. Let you, come be a part of a family that's marked by grace and mercy and forgiveness so that you can get cleaned up and you can go on and do something different and something better. You don't have to operate in the same system. That's the prophetic heart. And it brings us to the, the third point. First, we, we look. Second, we feel the gap, feel God's heart for the people that are separated by that gap. And then third, we have to think gospel. We've mentioned this before, but think gospel is, is a big deal. So many times Paul is writing to those, he's, uh, to the churches he's been to before, and he uh, challenges them, and we get all of these rules out of his challenge, but we miss the main thing, which is most often this message, think gospel. This is happening in your life, or you're seeing this, and you're trying to fix it in other ways that are not Jesus. It is possible to look at the world around us, feel the gap, and have the wrong response because we're not thinking gospel. It is possible to see the gap, feel the gap, and then respond the way the world does and say, let's change the system. The system doesn't change until we change. The system doesn't change until you and I take a step in the faithful and obedient direction. The system doesn't change until we confront the lies of the gap with the truth of Jesus. Any system that takes the place of gospel is a false system and will only perpetuate the problem. It will be one of those things that when Jesus comes back, he'll be like, listen, you did your best. (laughs) But you used the wrong tools. I got this, we'll fix it. <laughs> Friends, we've, we've been using the wrong tools. We've been looking for political answers. 
We've been looking for answers from power systems that God never intended to be an answer to the gap. When Paul writes and he corrects things around uh, how to treat women or how to treat slaves or any of those things, he doesn't say, listen, you guys at the next election cycle, um, do this for me. Uh, Really evaluate your candidates and make sure which you follow the one that looks more like Jesus. And um, yeah, you're going to disagree with the person on the other side of the aisle. That's okay. You're both sort of right and really wrong all at the same time. So that's fun. Um, no, yeah, so do that. Uh, vote for the person who's going to change the system. Get a, let's get a new Caesar in. How about that? No, Paul teaches them to think gospel. And he says, slaves or slave owners, don't treat them like the other people are treating their slaves. Treat them as image bearers of God, with, as people with dignity. You change the way you are living. You close the gap in the area of influence you have. Don't worry about that system. The more you do this, the more you wrap around that family that needs a family, the more you invite people in and you practice hospitality and you change their viewpoint of what grace and mercy and love looks like, the more we model the way it looks like to live out a right relationship with our spouses, the more the systems will change but from the ground up. Two weeks ago, we talked about the edict. Really briefly, we mentioned the edict of Milan in 310 which was essentially authorizing Christianity to be a legal uh, religion. Before that, it was all illegal. Do you want to know how they made it legal? There were just so many people now that believed in Jesus, they just had to recognize it. They're like, well, we don't really have a choice. (laughs) They're going to live that way regardless. So the system changed. They did not petition the system and say, we just need our voice. Will you please change things? No, because Paul was writing to the church and Peter was writing to the church and James and all of these other apostles were leading and writing to the churches and saying, no, you change. Look at the gap, feel the gap, and then what is the gospel answer to the gap? What is Jesus asking you to do? Where is the truth of Jesus intersecting this issue? And how then should you live in response? That's who we're called to be. Observers, feelers, gospel thinkers. That's truly what changes things. That's truly how we close this gap. Let's pray.